This is Dr. Jamie Kaufman, and this is Dr. Kaufman's Reflux Hour. Um, today I'm going to talk, as I often do, for 15 minutes on a topic, and then try to answer questions with the rest of the time. Today's topic is sort of a consolidation of my experience over the course of my lifetime. Uh, indeed, I was an economics major before I went to medical school, so I've actually been looking at health care um, uh, since uh, uh, 1968. And the big changes that have occurred in healthcare have occurred since that time. And so I wanted to write a piece, and I, I, I wrote uh, first the death of health, and then I changed it to the rape of health. Rape is a very you know, politically charged word, <clears throat> but death implies a, something passive, whereas rape implies something active, and it, it means the other non-sexual implications or definitions are to plunder or despoil. And so health has been plundered and despoiled starting back 100 years. Um, it's my guess that when the, the, the big uh, corporate giants, um, the, the Henry Fords and the Morgans and the Rockefellers uh, were having uh, a, a industrial revolution in their hands, that they had great influence with uh, the Congress, if not the president. And so there is a long history, actually, of uh, corporations uh, having the ear of, uh, of the, the powers that be in the government. Uh, this uh, talk, if you will, is divided into three sections. The first is uh, redesigning the emperor's clothes. And implied in that is the emperor doesn't have any clothes. Uh, and so this is the redesigning of the emperor's clothes uh, with regard to health care. Uh, second is morbid obesity of the health care system. And third is the most important one, which is I have some thoughts about what's going to require, what it's going to require to make some changes, um, which may be impossible. And so it's called fix health care and heal the nation. And I would say that if you look at health care, Healthcare is actually, I wasn't going to say microcosm, but a macrocosm of what's wrong. Uh, everything from um, uh, uh, corruption, uh, bribery, um, unethical behavior, uh, money being the sole goal of, of health and healthcare system uh, participants, meaning there are 907,000 907, companies that are involved in healthcare. And every one of them wants to make a profit. And the big ones, the pharma, big pharma and then J&J, &J, uh, they want to increase profits every year. Remember, corporations are like individuals and they're responsible only to themselves and to their stockholders. They're not responsible for health. They're responsible for profits. So red or blue, um, I would argue that health is not a political animal in the terms of it being uh, either, either right wing or left wing. It doesn't matter what your politics are. If you're having problems, you know, getting health care or paying for your premiums or whatever, uh, just you should know as an aside, um, health health care problems are the number one cause of bankruptcies in the United States, actually 77 percent. So I want to I want to say that I appeal to everyone um, that these ideas and that's what I'm presenting here are important ideas to consider. The, the, the next big shift in health and health care is what I call um, how McBurger uh, sold cultural obesity. Um, animals like salt and sugar and um, uh, fat. And so McDonald's came along, I, I first saw my first one in 1965. And as time has passed, um, we now see uh, an industry, a fast food industry, uh, worth a trillion dollars a year. That's a trillion. And um, along with the, if you look at the arc of how uh, income has risen over the course of the last 60 years um, with fast food, you'll see that literally every chronic disease follows its path from sleep apnea to asthma to reflux to esophageal cancer um, to diabetes, obesity. So the curve is the same and follows fast food. So we spend a trillion dollars a year to get sick. More importantly than that idea is the, is, is the second idea, which is that there's a trillion dollars being sent, spent on solutions that do nothing. 
Uh, everybody's interested in devices. So people ask me all the time about devices. They ask me about, you know, links to magnets and end of cinch, you know, none of them are worth anything. Those are venture capital people wanting to go in and make a bunch of money. And if the thing works or doesn't work, doesn't matter. Unfortunately, it's unethical. And f furthermore, the FDA no longer looks at them. They have to just be predicate devices. Go look that up, predicate devices. So they don't even really have to, to go the full way in testing there. Um, there's a, there's a, on, on, on Netflix, uh, there's a program on medical devices. Now comes the nitty gritty. Is health, is health, is, is, is health a right? Um, I would argue health is a right, just like air and water are rights. Um, health is not a commodity. It never should have been treated as a commodity. And here's why. This whole idea of its necessity. Um, is, a, in, 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 in economics, it's called a price and elasticity of demand. And here's what it means. Your son will need an operation to save his life. It'll be $250 cash. Your son will need an operation to save his life. It'll be 2,500 plastic. Your son will need an operation to save his life. It'll be 250,000. Oh, I don't take that much. Will you take my house? And so there is, there is inelasticity of demand. And you should know that the United States actually has the worst healthcare system, a lot of innovation, some of it good, some of it bad, but it has the worst healthcare system of all the Western nations. We have a, 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 a tremendous increase in cost compared to anyone else and worse outcomes. And that's things like uh, uh, complications and deaths after surgery and so on, infant mortality. So the idea that we're the best is, uh, is not true. We are, however, the most expensive. And uh, so this whole question of should healthcare be a right is almost ought to be a national re referendum. And if healthcare should be a right, uh, then you would want something like Medicare for all. The problem is if we made Medicare for all right now, let's just say a law was passed, the country would go bankrupt. So there's no way we can increase exposure um, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, the opportunity for people to join the healthcare system until we control costs. Um, In my area, reflux, particularly respiratory reflux, you have symptoms like post-nasal drip, sinus pressure, ear symptoms, swallowing symptoms, voice symptoms, breathing symptoms. There's no doctor for that. They've broken up the body into little parts anatomically, the, the throat people and the esophagus people and the lung people. And the reason they've done that, in my opinion, is so they don't kill each other, so they don't have turf wars. The problem is, that the respiratory system and the digestive system are one. And so when you talk about, just say, post-nasal drip, you can theoretically go to four different doctors, get four different diagnoses, get four different sets of x-rays, and maybe even have your sinuses operated on when the problem is silent nighttime reflux. So um, misdiagnosis isn't the rule, and it's for lots of money. Um, when I was uh, uh, looking at the patients that came to me, uh, with a chronic cough for more than 10 years. Um, they spent well over uh, uh, 250000 each um, uh, for tests and so on. So we're, we're talking about a very expensive system that is not very good for taking care of the common things. And that brings me to my next point, is the annihilation of the primary care physician. In every other healthcare system that works, the primary care physician is the first doctor you see. That's the doctor who gets paid enough so they can spend time with you, listen to you. You can establish rapport with them. Uh, him or her, you can, you, you, you can use and trust that person to have your back. And they should learn how to take care of integrated air adjusted medicine, asthma and reflux and postnasal drip and all the things that I take care of um, as a, a practicing integrated air adjusted medicine specialist. Specialist is a funny word. So, the primary care physician needs to be uh, re, uh, if you will, uh, reinstated. Now, this gets back to the question of how did it get so bad? And everyone's also worried, oh, we're going to have socialized health care. We're going to have socialized health care. We have socialized health care. What do you suppose Medicare is? The government has Medicare, and they set prices for everything. They decide certain things aren't worth being, for example, there's no good reflux testing right now uh, because the Reimbursement is so low, it's not worth doing. Um, and the same is true of transnasal esophagoscopy, though those are really important tests. 
So <clears throat> what has to happen is that Medicare needs to be reconfigured. Right now, you have stakeholders. So the head of the you know, ENT group is there, has a representative in gastroenterology and pulmonology. And the so they all sit around the table and they divide up a zero-sum dollar. You need to get all the stakeholders off that table. They can be an advisory board in another room and they can send recommendations. But what you really need are actuarials, people who look at health and healthcare and outcomes. And one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to start seeing uh, people who are actually dealing with diet and lifestyle. So maybe you'll see your doctor and then the doctor will send you to someone who knows how to uh, 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 manage your, your, your diet and lifestyle with, with, to help you. Maybe that's someone you even text with, it's someone you see on a regular basis. Theoretically, it could be, be a, uh, someone graduated from college and trained in, um, uh, 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 if you will, uh, providing information on, on healthy diet and lifestyle. Um, it is healthy diet and lifestyle that is an issue. And for you Americans who think I can eat whatever I want and it's too important to me to make any changes, um, you will get uh, a reflux uh, chances are 90 something percent. Uh, just this last week I put up a post, um, can uh, respiratory reflux cause death? And the answer it does, it can. So the fantasy that we're okay is based upon the idea that if you go to the emergency room and you've broken your hip and you get your surgery and everything comes out okay, um, that, that you had a, a good experience. The problem is that a procedure that should have cost or maybe 28000 ends up costing 380000 I mean, who thought of a $58 aspirin? So the, the, the Medicare is basically being controlled by uh, in, in the industries and by the providers. And so that has to change. You know, I went into medicine. I didn't go into a healthcare industry. Um, I had the influence of a, an uncle that I loved and trusted and, and, and adored for how he treated his patients. And I wanted to be like him. I knew I'd learn, earn a good link, income. I was never interested in money. Um, and I enjoyed helping people and I enjoyed being a surgeon. Um, I was a physician. I wasn't a business person. And now we have predominantly business people and some of the um, ways that deals are being made right now with providers, with physicians, is really unconscionable. They give you a job and they say, well, you have to bring in so much income or we'll fire you. And uh, so then they start getting uh, my kingdom for an MRI and a CT scan. So all the things that are really expensive get overused. I don't uh, want to go on about uh, uh, predatory corporations. Um, enough is said. Uh, the problem is that Congress, uh, they're all taking bribes to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're not going to make a rule that, that changes how pharma acts right now. We have to basically put representatives in eventually that represent the American people. So fix health care and heal the nation. Um, I think that this is such a big issue um, that if we could fix health care, even if it was done incrementally, it would have a, a great force of bringing the country together for people to help make decisions. For example, we could put on the ballot somewhere, somehow, um, uh, uh, the question of is, is health care right? Um, and uh, we should have on the ballot the question is, um, should uh, Medicare uh, have the resources to uh, negotiate the cost of drugs? We should be able to uh, uh, basically uh, control reimbursement for procedures that is now out of control. So universal health care, in my opinion, is, uh, is ethical and anything else is unethical and to first control costs. So. We need greater egalitarianism. We need greater uh, cooperation. The American dream is not to make, uh, uh, be able to acquire $100 billion and uh, be a country onto yourself. That's not the American dream. We ought to go back to graduated income tax with no sheltering. Um, I remember when I started to make a lot of money way back when, I was in almost a 50% tax bracket by the time I asked added state and income and everything else. And I didn't mind at all. I felt it was my responsibility to do so. And so we need a healthcare system that has empathy, efficiency, access for everyone, 
and, uh, and regulation. And regulation will mean we take a physician, for example, to a rural area and we have to pay him or her more because the resources aren't there to create income. So I think this is an important topic. Remember income and elasticity of demand. Remember that uh, the system is broken, that Medicare is no longer um, controlling prices, and that uh, companies like Big Pharma, J&J, uh, &J and all that are really predatory. So that's all I have to say about this. Um, I'm thinking about doing a short book. Uh, these are all chapters. Um, you know, I went into medicine, not the healthcare industry. The word wasteful needs redefinition. The ship is sinking. The specialist model of American medicine has failed. Annihilation of the primary care. So anyway, I think that people have to start thinking that the healthcare system is broken. And the reason it's broken is because it is basically all about money. And so that's all I have to say about that. I have questions, and uh, I'm going to answer questions now for the rest of the time we have available. And um, I want to say that there's a lot of redundancy in these questions. And I guess the problem is that I've written about almost all of these things on my blog, jamiekaufman.com. Um, I've been writing pretty close to a blog every week for two years or more, three years. There, I think there are 116 posts uh, up there. So there's one on gum chewing. There's one on hiatal hernias. People ask me all the time about hiatal hernias. There's a big one on, on and Gaviscon and, and, and alginates that I just put up a week or so ago. And so a lot of these questions, some of these questions are a little bit redundant. Um, and, and many of them are good, very good questions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take them one at a time, even though they go back and forth, for example. There are more questions about alginates as we go forward. I've heard that the skins on lemons, on almonds, are hard to digest and maybe soaking them is a good idea. Thoughts? This is from Diana. Um, I don't know the answer to that. To my knowledge, almonds are the best of the nuts in terms of the reflux uh, uh, risk, uh, uh, whereas the cashews are the worst. Um, the three good ones are pistachios, almonds, and walnuts, and the bad ones are all the rest. Peanuts are uh, right between. So I don't know if soaking is a good idea or not. I don't think they're hard to digest. Uh, at least I don't have any evidence to say so. Here's a really good question. And um, I'm really sorry I don't have a lemon in the house because I would have uh, gone ahead and zested it. The question is, what about lemon zest? I've used it as a lemon substitute, reportedly low acid recipe. I have not measured lemon zest, but I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts, and I will do it. And if I don't tell you differently, lemon zest is fine. My guess is lemon zest is somewhere between uh, five and, and six, um, and it's perfectly fine to use. In fact, if you look at my cooking over time, um, all my lemons are white because I've zested them. And the, and the thing that I have is called a microplane, and it goes in the dishwasher, and it's really good, and you can zest uh, uh, wildly, and it really makes a difference on a lot of things, especially fish. If pepsin dies, this is from Emil, if pepsin dies at pH 8, why do we still have symptoms? I drink alkaline water all day and I spray countless of times with the sodium bicarbonate. Okay, first of all, you don't need to spray with sodium bicarbonate. We never know how much bicarbonate. Um, the picture that I recommend makes 9.5 water and I have 9.5 water in here. When you swallow, the lower part of your throat clamps tight as a fist so you don't aspirate. So you don't get any on your vocal cords in most of your lower throat area. If you put your pH 9.5 water in here, pepsin dies at 8. This is a useful treatment. So Emil, the problem isn't that you're not treating the tissue in some way. The problem is you still have reflux. Um, you know, what time do you eat dinner? What time do you go to bed? What's your diet like? Um, you know, how much caffeine or nicotine do you have? You need to look at the uh, detox diet, um, which is a relatively recent post. I think it was the beginning of this year, January. Um, and uh, remember, JamieKaufman.com was written for all the people who do consultations with me to, so they can go back and find answers and find uh, how you spell, for example, amitriptyline or Gaviscon Advance and so on. So the answer is pepsin does die at eight, but you're not getting rid of your pepsin because if you have one reflux episode a week into your throat, that stuff hangs on uh, to the tissue like lobsters and even gets in the tissue. 
So the answer is your refluxes are not under control, probably. Um, I was recently asked if using alkaline water to take medication lessens the absorption of the medicine. I really don't think so. Um, and um, I, I've been doing this for more than 40 years. Another question comes up. Um, is, um, is it supposed to be a gap between taking Gaviscon, alginates, and other medicines? I don't believe any of that. You can, in the evening, when, before you go to bed, you're taking your, your uh, uh, formonidine, and you're taking whatever else you take, and you're taking your, your Gaviscon Advance. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, they can all be taken together. I take the Gaviscon Advance last, I would recommend. Now, here comes a really important question. Is Gaviscon a good thing for someone who's developed stage one achalasia? So the first question is, do you really have achalasia? Because by far the most common cause of esophageal dysmotility is reflux. And if you fix the reflux, esophageal function returns to normal. I've had patients with complete non-function, a dead tube, aperistalsis of the esophagus, come back to flat normal with reflux treatment. So, you know, do you really have achalasia and how is the diagnosis made? Um, Let's assume that you have achalasia. Let's not even talk about stage one. I'm not sure what stage one means. If you have achalasia, I have a, I've seen, I've seen a lot of patients over the years. First of all, you need to buy a bed that goes up and down. And you need to sleep as high as you can. Number two, your evening meal has to be your smallest meal of the day. Number three, Gaviscon and formodidine. And um, uh, there's, a, there's an article on, on Barrett's. And I read that article on Barrett's. And, uh, but the, having an incline and a long period of time. This week I'm writing one, uh, a blog, um, does intermittent fasting help acid reflux? And I'll talk about there's different types of intermittent fasting. So if you have achalasia, you need to make sure you're not refluxing at night and do everything you can to avoid that. Um, and again, all achalasia is not the same. So I, I was acid free, this is a, a, a Gabriella, I was acid free through your tips, but now I caught a cold and with the congestion, the acid returned, uh, can illnesses trigger? So absolutely, by far. Um, now remember, you may, you may have had reflux all along, this is the straw that broke the camel's back, but upper respiratory infections, any and all of them, including COVID, uh, the flu, uh, can trigger reflux. Um, so can, for example, uh, many antibiotics. I've written an article on uh, medicines that cause reflux um, I've written one on supplements, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and so um, no question, when you have an upper respiratory infection, that's when you tighten the ship, okay? You got to make sure that you're not eating too late. You got to make sure that your diet's clean. You got to make sure you're not having anything out of a bottle or a can, uh, you know, like a soda and so on. So someone asked me about alkaline drops. So I think last week's um, people have been asking me forever do these alkaline drops work. So I got, I don't know if you've seen it. By the way, sign up for the blog. You put your email address in. And what happens is you get an email each week. It just tells you the topic. And if you're interested, you open it or save it. And if you're not interested, you delete it and wait for the next one. So all you do is where sub subscribe, put your email in. But anyway, I tested um, alkaline water drops uh, last week. And to my surprise, they're terrific. Um, uh, Alkazone, uh, Alkalife, and... And Swanson all, um, the first two are just three drops in an eight ounce glass of water, gives you a pH that's around 10, which is fantastic. And by the way, you can't make it too, too, too alkaline, uh, no harm. So uh, drinking 9.5 or 10 is just fine, and these alkaline water drops work. Um, when you go in a restaurant, you can probably get tap water. Almost all tap water is around seven. Um, it's adjusted. There are some places where uh, the water is a little more alkaline. But alkaline water drops work, and, uh, and they're better than baking soda. Someone asked me, Michael, what about baking soda? We have no idea how much baking soda you put in. You put in a half teaspoon, a quarter teaspoon per eight ounces. I mean, I've never done that experiment. I guess I should. But um, we have good alkaline, uh, good, good alkaline water and good alkaline water drops, so you don't have to experiment with now. There is one indication. Let's just say you're having chest pain and you're not sure whether it's a heartburn, if it's reflux, or you're having a heart attack. Um, besides taking an aspirin, you ought to have a little bit of water with a teaspoon 
a uh, big, big water with a teaspoon of, of, of bicarbonate and see if that makes it all go away. It's probably reflux. Doesn't mean you shouldn't go to the emergency room, but um, treating someone with bicarbonate is a good idea um, uh, as, a, as, as a test. I frequently have a piece, of, this is uh, from Cindy. Uh, frequently have a piece of sourdough bread for breakfast with either peanut butter or avocado. Um, even though avocado is a, is a high fat food, there are three foods that absolutely are fine for reflux. Um, olive oil, you can have all you want. Fish, particularly wild caught um, West Coast salmon and avocados. And uh, no one in my experience of maybe 100,000 people has said, and I talk about these things, what are your trigger foods? And uh, so avocado is not a sugar food. Peanut butter is, if you look, I've written an article, I think, on peanut butter uh, a, a couple of months ago. And um, yeah, there is an article on peanuts. And so I, I don't know about peanuts um, for sure, but I do know that avocado is fine. Um, now, this one, I'm, I'm not even where to go, but it needs an answer. This is Evie. What can be done for swollen tongue due to reflux? I'm miserable. I've been in a clean diet for two years and I still have this symptom. It's debilitating. Now, what's debilitating? The tongue is so big that you can't swallow. It's a burning tongue. You, I mean, it's not clear what, what this means. Does it feel big, but it's actually real size? So much that I'm looking into surgery, I can't take it. It also burns on and off. So I would take a look at the article on neurogenic. Uh, there are only three things I normally treat, um, which is a uh, voice use pain, burning throat, and I don't mean heartburn type all the time, and, uh, and uh, neurogenic cough. But burning tongue is in the same category, and it's often neurogenic. So the same medicines can be used to treat it. If you have LPR, you ought to see an ENT and, and, and see if he or she can determine whether that's still the case. If so, you may need to tighten up a few things. It's good, we're doing fine. Now this comes to, there are several questions. How do you know the difference between silent reflux and vagus nerve damage? The answer is silent reflux is 98% of you and nerve damage is two or 5% of you. So doesn't mean it's not due to nerve damage. Let me tell you my story quickly. Um, I was sick on Christmas day with the flu. Um, three days later, I had no voice. I had a paralyzed left vocal cord. It's still paralyzed. Today I sound a little worse than usual. Um, and then I got cough that wouldn't go away and all the reflux symptoms. So the vagus nerves live right under the lining membranes. There are many articles on the vagus nerve. Read part one and part two at least. Um, it's a three-part article. And so the vagus nerve gets hit by the virus, which just lives right under the lining of the throat. And you can have um, a number of symptoms, including neurogenic symptoms uh, and reflux symptoms and the onset of reflux. And, uh, but meanwhile, when all is said, uh, reflux is way up here and the neurogenic is down here. So if you treat the reflux, the other stuff goes away. Um, if you have a cough, for example, it's a wet cough, it's a reflux cough, wet is reflux, and now you've done everything, all your other symptoms are gone, but you have a, a dry cough, especially a dry cough, you go into air conditioning, change of temperature, a burning toast, all that, then you have a neurogenic cough, and that ought to be treated. So um, most people um, don't have vagus nerve damage as a diagnosis, um, they have reflux, and so the ref whether the reflux started with a, a vagal insult is not important. So everybody, you know, last, the last question is, um, uh, this one has uh, LPR, for respiratory reflux, for four years. Start using the term respiratory reflux, please. And remember, started uh, following a cold, post-viral vagal mouth. Been taking gabapentin, been on it for a while. I still have reflux. How do I know if it's a vagus? The, 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 the gabapentin is knocking this patient out. The gabapentin should be stopped. One dose a week, taking four doses, getting out to three, and another week, two, and then, and then so it takes you four weeks to get off it. It's not for you. Reflux treatment is for you. And there's a whole blog with hundreds of posts uh, for you. So anyway, this has been, I'm sorry about being a day late, uh, Dr. Kaufman's um, Reflux Hour. And by the way, if you have questions, put them on uh, the dropping acid and even recommendations for uh, topics. Well, thank you very much.